In chapter eight, we're going to build a conceptual framework that will allow us to make the final big jump in our course from descriptive statistics and probability into inferential statistics, which is chapters nine and 10 and beyond. To make that leap, we need to have a strong conceptual understanding of two things, the distribution of the sample means, which, we'll, which is what we'll talk about in 8.1, and the distribution of the sample proportions, which is what we'll talk about in 8.2. So to make that jump, we need to kind of build this framework work of what's going to happen. How do sample means get distributed and how do sample proportions get distributed? All right, so let's start with 8.1. Let's think about sample means and it'll be hopefully a little bit clearer if we have a concrete example to kind of hook our understanding onto. So I have this little exploratory example here. So imagine that we have the mean score for all SAT test takers this year, which is thousands and thousands of people, but their mean score is a thousand and the standard deviation is 200. So if we look at individual scores, which is what we've done all up until this point, so chapter three, chapter four, five, six, and seven, it's looking at individual test takers. If you think about any one of those students, they create a shape, right? There is a shape for all of them, right? If you make a histogram out of it or a dot plot out of it, that, that, that graph would have some kind of shape to it. Then there's a center, to that graph and there's some spread to that graph. Now, because we don't know how this is going to work, the shape is unknown to us, right? We don't know the shape. It could be skewed left, it could be skewed right, it could make, you know, some kind of camelback shape, it could be bimodal, we, you know, we just don't even know. Um, it could be a big blobby mess, right? It's possible. All of those things are possible. Now, to be honest with you, the way most of those, they're called standardized tests, the SATs, ACTs, those kinds of things, the way they usually work is they're usually normal. So there's usually a normal shape to them that the tests are designed to be that way. However, we don't know that at this point, so um, we can't make any guarantees. That's, that's using knowledge I have of the situation, but it wasn't given to us in the problem anywhere, so I'm just going to go with unknown. I don't know what the shape of this is. Now the center, the center is interesting. They give us the center right here. They say that it's a thousand. And while I'm on the subject, they give us the spread and they say it's 200. So that tells us that our center, which is the mean of individual test scores, right? So mu sub X, X being the test scores, right? Individual test scores. Here, make this bigger so you can see. So individual test scores is, a thousand, right? So if I look at the distribution of all the individual test scores, if it makes some kind of blobby shape, the center of that blob is still a thousand. The spread is 200. Now we've been interpreting how that would get written up as an interpretation since ooh, the first weeks of the class. So it's saying, hey, if I grab any one student at random from this group, I would expect them to have a score of 1,000, give or take 200, which means I expect a score um, for an individual to be between, oops, I typed that wrong, <laughs> for an individual to be between 800 and 1,200. That's what I would expect, right? That give or take. Now, of course, of course, some students are above and below this. Right, many students are below 800 and above 1200, right? The give or take doesn't mean that you can't have people beyond that. It's just that that's where the, the majority of students are going to be. Matter of fact, that's probably a better way to put it. I expect a majority of students, more than 50%, to score between 800 and 1200 but many students are going to score below or above, you know, it's kind of the difference between a uh, proportion interpretation and a probability interpretation that we saw in section 7.1. So you can think about it, any one student should score in that range or um, the majority of students should score in that range. All right, that was for one student though, right? Thinking about an individual student, individual students and looking at their scores. All right, now let's imagine that a building is full of people in classrooms that are taking the SATs. And in every single room, there's 30 people taking this test, 30 random people. I should add the word random, sorry about that. 
30 random people taking this test. All right, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk in that room and I'm gonna take those 30 students and I'm not going to actually figure out what any one of those students scores. I want the average for the room. That is, I wanna look at X bar for that room, right? X bar being the sample mean. So I wanna look at X bar for that room and see what it is. And then I wanna to go to the next room and look at their X bar. And then I wanna to go to the next room and look at their X bar. So I'm not caring what any one of the students gets because you can get a student that's at 1400, no problem. But I wanna think about the average for the room of 30 people. And then I wanna think about how that compares to all the other averages for rooms of 30 people. That's gonna create its own distribution that has its own shape, center, and spread. Now, interestingly enough, the shape will actually become normal. So we'll talk more about why that is in a minute, but it becomes normal shaped. And it makes a certain kind of sense. If you're talking about averages for different groups, they're not gonna be close to each other. Right? They're going to be, or excuse me, they are going to be close to each other. They're, it's going to be hard to be far away from each other. So most of the rooms are going to get clumped up in the center. So it's going to create this kind of normal curve shape. Now the center is going to stay at what it was, right? It's still going to be a thousand, but the reason for it is different. It's because, oh, sorry, I'm having some issues with my screen here when you look from room to room, if a thousand truly is the center, then it's going to be the center for that new group grouping of sample mean to sample mean to sample mean. So the average is still expected to be a thousand because that's what it was for all of the individual test takers. So that's what it should be from for room to room to room to room comparison, which is what we're trying to look at here. Now, but the interesting thing is the spread. We don't know what the spread is, but we know that it should be smaller than sigma. Right, let me draw you a little picture here, so or a big picture, depending on how this looks. So you can see the pink kind of blobby one. That's the distribution for individuals, which we're talking about up here. Right, when We're talking about how do individual students fare. But then we're looking at the distribution of the sample means, the X bars from room to room to room. And we're saying, look, it's got the same center. They're both centered at that thousand line. And the shape is normal, right? Becomes this kind of normal curve, right? Great. But the spread, the spread is getting to be a lot smaller. That pink kind of blob thing is way more spread out, right? The distribution of individuals is way more spread out than it is for the um, sample means. And it makes a certain kind of sense because if you're talking about, hey, take this room of 30 people, take their mean. Go to the next room of 30 people, take their mean they're not gonna be that far apart from each other, right? Individual students, sure, you can get a student score at 1400 sitting next to a student that scores 600, no problem. But to get to a room of people scoring 600 as their mean, that would mean half the students in that room score below 600, which is crazy low, right? This does not gonna happen. So we don't know what sigma sub x bar is. Sigma sub x bar is the spread for the room of 30, right? So this is the spread for the mean of 30 random test scores. And we know that it's smaller, smaller than 200. We don't know how big it is, but we know that much. It has to be less than 200. It has to be, right? Otherwise, it would make no sense, right? It has to be that the pink portion, which is when it's all spread out, individual students are kind of all over the place. But when you look from room to room to room and take the average of the room to the average of the next room to the average of the next room, everybody's going to kind of balance out. You're going to have high sto scores in the rooms and low scores in each of the rooms, but they'll all kind of average out to the center, right? So the wisdom of the crowd, if you will. So everybody will kind of end up kind of in the middle together with each other, right? If you look at room to room to room, what's their average? So we don't know what it is yet. It's coming, but we know that it's smaller than 200. All right. So that's the first bit. 
that what we're looking at is a sampling distribution. So we're looking at a statistic from sample to sample to sample. In particular, at this point, we're interested in the sample mean. How does the sample mean vary from sample to sample to sample? So if I take one sample of size n, in my example above it's 30, to the next sample of size 30, to the next sample of size 30, how does the x bar for each of those samples compare? That's what the central limit theorem asks and answers. Now it has to have certain conditions met, but down here you can see it's going to be normal, just like we said it was. It's going to have a center right there that is equal to mu, just like we said it would. And then the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of sample means, that spread that we're talking about, is going to get its own formula that's related to sigma, but it's smaller than sigma because you're going to divide by the square root of n. Now these things are going to happen if we can meet the conditions above. But let's write this down over here. Let's go back here real quick. So the standard error, so the spread becomes the standard error. Instead of standard deviation, we look at standard error of the sample means, right? which is the standard error of x bar. That's the formula for it. If I can get that to happen. There we go. Which in our case would be 200. Oops, let me make this larger so you can see. It's 200 over the square root of 30. Which, if you grab a calculator, you can find to be about 36.5. So that is the standard error. Right, so the spread is no longer the standard deviation, it's the standard error, which is a standard deviation, but it's a standard deviation of the sampling distribution of sample means. It's a standard deviation of the X bars, which gets its own name. Computers call it this, SE, standing for standard error of the X bars. And that's the formula for it according to the central limit theorem. So it was considerably less than 200. As a matter of fact, it's about 36.5. So you can think of that little green curve as having a, a spread of 36.5, where the pink curve had a spread of 200. Right? Way more spread out on that pink curve, which is what's being done up here, than on the green curve, which is what's being done down here, the 36.5. Now, this whole thing only works if you have some conditions met. Namely, you need the condition number one that it's random, condition number two that it's independent, and condition number three that it's normal. And we're going to stop right here and talk about those conditions in the next video. But we've, we've talked about the big concept, which is you're looking at a distribution of X bars, no longer at X's, not individuals, X bars, sample means. And you want to think about how those sample means are distributed. They have a shape that will become normal. They will have a center that is the same as what it was for the whole population, which is mu. But they will have a spread that is considerably less because it's harder to get far away from the mean for X bars because the highs and the lows in any one sample will balance each other out and you'll end up closer to the center for X bars. Often, by the way, we don't know sigma, and in those cases, we'll have to use an approximation, which is s over the square root of n. So just keep that in mind.